Good morning. It's good to see each one of you out this morning. As we announced last week, Brother Charles is in a gospel meeting starting today through Wednesday in Keltenburg, Tennessee, over in DeKalb County. Before we get our class going this morning, are there any announcements? Anything needs to be brought before the class before we begin? Keep sister. Sister Paulette Lawson, her prayer, she's in NHC. She got moved there this few days ago. And also Brother Winford Sadler is at NHC, and both of those are at Tullahoma. So hopefully they continue to recover and to gain their strength and everything. We have with us this morning Brother Sam Lawrence. Brother Sam has been with us before. Most of you know Brother Sam. He has been going to the Southeast Institute of Biblical Studies and he will be graduating in May. It's only a few short weeks away. After his graduation, as he mentioned to us last time he was here, he's gonna be working in Tasmania. He's going to Australia in August to be working with the congregation there. So let's keep him in our prayers and thank God for his abilities and his desire to go to work in that foreign country to help spread the gospel. And that takes a lot of dedication and encourage and hopefully that everything will go well for him. So without any further, we'll let Brother Sam have our class this morning. Everybody hear me okay? Can you hear me? Well, good morning again. I am very thankful to be here with y'all again. Um, I, I, I say it, I think, just about every time I come here, but I, I mean it. I, I very much enjoy getting to come to New Union. It's absolutely one of my favorite places to get to come to. Uh, everybody's always so nice, so welcoming, so kind. And uh, I'm looking for him. I, I don't see him in here. He may not be in here. And y'all have Larry Turner here. You know, he's just a wonderful guy. I see a bunch of, a bunch of faces being made back there. No, I, I, I think... Uh, Dennis, Larry Turner, uh, Brother Dean, I, I, I mean, I just, uh, everybody here that I've had the pleasure of meeting has been a wonderful person. And, uh, and so I'm very thankful for the opportunity to be here and, and all that y'all have done for me while being in school. And so uh, the lesson this morning, I, I kind of was going back and forth and I, I kind of pulled an audible. It might wind up, uh, might wind up not turn out too well, but um, this morning what I'm going to do in the class is I'm going to talk about a little bit about evangelism. And so we're going to go to Matthew chapter 28, and this is probably going to turn out more like a, a sermon than it does a Bible class, but uh, hopefully uh, it'll encourage us and help us all. Um, I was talking with somebody yesterday, or, or studying with somebody yesterday about uh, just evangelism, and how evangelism is, in my opinion, one of the most difficult things to do. It's one of the hardest things to do. You know, I know it's one of the things that makes me the most nervous. It's one of the things that I always have to... Uh, pull myself, uh, you know, I always have to make myself do it sometimes because it's, uh, it's difficult, it's hard. It's, uh, it can be scary at times, it can be uncomfortable at times, it can, uh, you know, sometimes turn into an awkward conversation. Sometimes if you're talking to your family or your friends, well, sometimes you can really uh, put a strain in that relationship after something you've said. Uh, but even though it's difficult, even though it's hard, you know, every one of us here today, if we're Christians, uh, somebody taught us, you know, who taught you? Who taught me? Uh, you know, that probably wasn't very easy for them. But sitting here today, are you thankful that they taught you? Are you thankful that they took time to share the gospel with you? Uh, you know, Matthew 7 verse 12 tells us, you know, the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Well, if we knew somebody, and we all do, every one of us, somebody outside of Christ, uh, would we want them, if we were in their shoes, would we want them to share the gospel with us if we were lost? Every one of us would. And so it's up to us. It's, up to, it's our responsibility to, to do it, every single person. 1 Timothy 3 verse 15 says that the church is the pillar and buttress of the truth, which just means that it's the one that, that holds up the truth. It's the one that sends forth the truth. The church, the Lord's church, is the one that holds up the truth. And so if the Lord's church doesn't go out and evangelize, doesn't go out and try and make new Christians, then who will? Well, the answer to that is no one. If we don't, no one will. 
If we don't share the gospel, if we don't try and uh, take the Great Commission to anyone and everyone, uh, no one else will. And so it's up to us. Every single one of us has a responsibility. And so Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, if you would go ahead and turn there with me, Matthew 28. And specifically, we'll look at verses 18 through 20. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. And before we get started with the lesson this morning, would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Dear all-knowing and all-powerful and ever-present God and Father in heaven, heavenly and holy Father, we are so very thankful for the pleasure and privilege in which you give us to be able to assemble together as your church. Father, we're thankful for the opportunity that you give us to be a part of your family. Father, to be children of yours by obedience to the gospel and by becoming a Christian. Father, knowing that you have done so much for us, you have forgiven us of our sins, you bless us with all spiritual blessings that are in Christ. Father, you have done so much for us, and Father, we know that now we have a hope in heaven because of all that you've done for us and our accepting and coming to terms the conditions you put out for us. Father, help us to never take these things for granted, but to always remember that being a Christian is the greatest thing that we can ever hope to have this side of heaven. And help us, Father, to take that and to share it with others. Father, we ask that as we study your word, you would help us to have eyes that see, ears that hear, and a heart that's open to your word. Help us to uh, rightly apply your word and to uh, rightly divide your word to our own lives, to not just be uh, forget forgetful hearers, but doers of the word as well. And Father, help us to have the love, the courage, and the boldness to do whatever it takes to share your word with others and to do all that we can to try and bring lost souls to Christ. And Father, help us to see the urgency in this and to uh, see how it's up to us to do this. And Father, we ask that you would be with us now as we study your word. We thank you for your son and all that he did for us. We thank you for the sacrifice in which he gave, gave his life for us. And again, Father, help us to never forget this, but to always keep this in the forefront of our minds. We love you, Father, and we're thankful for the opportunity you've given us to be a part of your church and to be assembled here this morning. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. And so, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, uh, no doubt a familiar text uh, to probably just about all of us. I imagine a lot of people in here can probably just quote it, uh, quote it from memory. Uh, but we're going to look at it again this morning, and we're going to read it and pull out just a few points from it. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Verse 18 says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so we are going to just look at three just straightforward points from this text. The first one being go. Well, go, that's, uh, that's an action word. Uh, if somebody tells us to go, well, uh, that means we are to respond in some way to that command. That means we are to uh, go and do whatever that person has told us. Well, in this case, that person is Jesus Christ. Uh, we see Jesus uh, tells us, before he tells us to go, he gives us, uh, uh, it's not the right way to say it, he gives us his credentials. That's not really what I'm looking for there. But he basically, he tells us that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. And so if there's anybody that should tell us to go and we should listen to, it's, it's Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus Christ is the Son of God and Jesus Christ is God. And so Jesus Christ has told us to go. And so the Christian has the responsibility to take action. And so again, Jesus had just told his disciples uh, that he has all authority. And some might say, perhaps, that you know, this is something that's, that was only given to the disciples. This is something that they accomplished in their day and therefore this is something that really doesn't matter to us. Well, that's not the case. Uh, we look at verse 20 of Matthew chapter 18, and uh, there we're told that after disciples are made, uh, it tells us to uh, teach, all, teach them all things in which I have commanded you. Well, Jesus had just commanded them. He had just given them the Great Commission. And so since he had just given that to them, then they are to give that to us, and then we are to continue to take that and share it with others today. And then after we make disciples, after we uh, baptize individuals, and after individuals become Christians, uh, they are to continue that. It's a cycle. It's uh, something that continues. Uh, we teach someone, that someone teaches somebody, and it's, it's a continuing chain. Uh, you think about it this way, and it's, and it's really an amazing thing to think about. Uh, again, you think about who it was that, inter that introduced you to the gospel. Uh, who taught you? Well, you think about who taught them. You think about who taught them. 
Who taught them? And then back, back, back. You think about the chain of events that took place in order for that person, whoever taught you, uh, and then who taught them. And so it creates this kind of uh, this, this ripple effect. Uh, we teach somebody, that person teaches somebody. Who, who knows what that person might do after, after we teach them the gospel? I mean, uh, what, could, what somebody can do after they've been taught the gospel, uh, they, they could be just a tremendous asset to the kingdom, to the church. You know, that one soul you or I might teach, who's to say they don't become a gospel preacher and wind up converting thousands of people? Uh, all because we took the time to share the gospel of Christ with them. And so we should follow the example of the early church. Uh, we see in Acts 8, verses 1 through 4. Acts 8, verses 1 through 4. Uh, of, cur- of course, that's um, right after it's told that, uh, you know, Saul had just stoned Stephen. Or Saul had just uh, held the coats as those who were uh, going after or rushing after Stephen and stoned him. And so then you come to Acts chapter 8 and you have this great persecution that rises up in the church. And Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 4 says this. It says, And Saul approved of his execution, again talking about Stephen. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea, Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him, but Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went abroad, doing what? Preaching the word. And someone might say, well, this is just the apostles. Well, that's not the case because we look back to verse 1. And at the very end of verse 1, it says they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea, Samaria, except the apostles. And so this is everyone except the apostles who went about preaching the word. Well, This tells us that every Christian that was scattered abroad went about teaching, uh, went about trying to share the gospel with others. And you think about what they were doing and, and what they were in the midst of as they were doing this. You know, they were in the midst of severe persecution. They were in the midst of difficult times. Uh, but yet they went about preaching the Word. They went about teaching others. And so they all went about preaching the Word, not just the apostles. Uh, even though it wasn't easy, they still went out and taught others. And so having, having seen this uh, in the midst of what they were in and, and how every single one of them went out and taught, um, let's apply this to ourselves. Again, I'm sure, like I said, I know for me, evangelism is, is no doubt the most difficult thing for me. It is something that, that uh, I try my, my very best to constantly work on, but I know I could absolutely do better. Uh, I think back on opportunities that I've spurned, uh, you know, times that opportunities have just fallen in my lap. But because I was too afraid to say anything, I spurned and wasted those opportunities. And so evangelism is something that even though it's difficult, even though it's hard, even though it's uncomfortable, we've got, we have to make ourselves do it. We have to push ourselves. We have to try every day our very best, uh, not just get into a rhythm and say, well, uh, you know, I'm all right, I'm a Christian, you know, I'm just going to do my best to try and avoid anybody and everybody and not try and talk about Jesus at all, because it's easy to do that. It's more comfortable to do that. It's more comfortable to try and blend in rather than stand out. But we've got to teach others. And if we're going to teach others, that means we're going to have to be different. That means we're going to have to stand out. Uh, That means we're not going to be friends with everybody. Jesus says in John 15, verse 18, the disciples, he said, Don't be surprised if the world hates you. Know that it has hated me first. If the sinless Son of God was hated by the world, uh, then I can expect, especially if, if I'm teaching the truth, to not be liked by everyone. But we have to do our best to love everyone And if we love everyone, we're going to teach them the truth. We cannot help but teach people the truth if we love them. Because if we neglect to teach somebody the truth, then we cannot say that we love them. Because biblically, love is doing what's best for somebody regardless of what it costs you, regardless of uh, whether or not you think they deserve it. Uh, What better thing can we do for anybody than try and teach them the gospel and try and bring them in to Christ? That's the greatest thing we can do for anybody. But we cannot make excuses and put it off. Uh, James 4, verse 17 is a very sobering verse. And it simply just tells us this, to him who knows to do good and does it not, to him it's sin. Uh, Which means if if I know something's right, the Great Commission, for example, if I know God has commanded me to go and to teach and I refuse to do it, well, that's a sin. Uh, Not only when I do what what, what God tells me not to do, uh, not only when I do that is it sin, but it's also sin when I refuse to do what God has told me to do. And so 
disobeying the Great Commission and not doing it is indeed a sin. And so we can't say that I'm afraid. Again, this is an easy one to fall into. This is one that I have caught myself in. Uh, This is one that uh, it's extremely easy to catch yourself in, but it's extremely important that we do not let ourselves live there. Uh, We cannot use that excuse and expect to make it to heaven. Revelation 21 verse 8 tells us this. It says, But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And so the faithless, the murderers, sexually immoral, and and we're probably thinking, okay, yeah, absolutely, I can understand that. But the first one mentioned is the cowards. The cowards. If we allow ourselves to be too scared to tell somebody, to try and help somebody come to Christ, then we will lose our soul because of that. Uh, If we don't try and help somebody to go to heaven, then we cannot expect to go there ourselves. It is absolutely something that is extremely important, and it is actually absolutely something that uh, every Christian must be involved in. So Matthew 25, verse 25, this is a a parable I'm sure many of us again are familiar with. This is the parable of the talents. Uh, You have the one man who had five talents. He went and traded and made five more. The one man had two talents, went and traded and had two more. But the one talent man, what did he do with his talent? He, He hid it. He buried it. The others had taken what they had and were told at the beginning of the parable that God had given to each as he was able. Each, he had given each according to their ability what they were able to do. Uh, the one talent man, he took his talent and he hid it. And we see this, Matthew 25, verse 25. When the master comes back and he settles, his, settles everything with the, uh, the man he had entrusted his talents with, He says this, Matthew 25, verse 25, the one talent man says this back to the master. He says, So I was afraid, and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. Well, he was afraid. He didn't lose his talent. He didn't spurn it. He just didn't do anything with it. Uh, And again, of course, you know, a talent is a large sum of money, uh, 75 pounds either of gold, silver, uh, and whatever amount that might be, it doesn't necessarily matter. It's It's a lot. They were entrusted with a lot. And so they were expected to use it. And so again, the one-talent man was afraid, went and hid his. And we remember the master, uh, he, he tells the servants to take that man away and to cast him away into where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And he takes his one talent and he gives it to the one that has five, or at this point has ten. And he says, to him who has, more will be given. But to him who has not, even what he has will be taken away from him. And so what this is, this is a use it or lose it kind of principle which I'm not wanting to get too far away from where we are here. This is basically saying, and Romans 12, verse 4 and 5 will kind of tell us the same thing. Uh, In 1 Corinthians 12, if you look there about how each member in the body are placed there by God and each is given certain talents, certain abilities. But basically, every one of us here without exception, uh, if we're a Christian, every single one of us here without exception, even if we're not a Christian, you know, if we were to become Christians, every single one of us has been given some sort of talent, some sort of ability, that God expects us to use. And of course, uh, we're stewards of everything because everything belongs to God. Uh, We don't own anything. God owns everything. And so being stewards of talents, of abilities, of resources, but primarily here we're talking about talents or abilities that we have, how are we using those? Uh, Are we using those to help advance ourselves professionally, to help advance ourselves maybe with popularity? we have to make sure we're using those for God and for His kingdom. Because if we're not using those for God and for His kingdom, then we cannot say that we are being faithful stewards. Uh, you know, every one of us, you know, some of us are, are, are better at things than others. Uh, you know, some of us are, are very good at, at leading singing. That's not me at all. Uh, I, can, I can run just about everybody in here out of the room really fast if I start singing. But some of us are better at things than others. Some of us are better at singing. Some of us are better at, uh, uh, my mind's kind of going blank, but uh, some of us are better at other things than others. And so how are we using our talents and abilities? Are we using them for God? Are we using them specifically in trying to bring other people into the church? Uh, Because we have to make sure we're using what God has given us for Him, for His kingdom. And so we can't say we're afraid this didn't work for the one talent man. Uh, The one talent man was cast away into where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
Now, Revelation 21 verse 8, we're told that cowards will be cast into the lake of fire. And so how do we overcome? Because uh, that fear is a real thing. You know, that fear is a real thing. Uh, you know, still, just about every time I go and, and try and talk with somebody, I, 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 I'm afraid. I have butterflies. I, I'm nervous. But how do we push past that fear? Well, in order to overcome, we can do this. We can take somebody with us. Uh, I know I feel a whole lot better when I've got somebody with me. Uh, you know, I was privileged uh, to be able to work, uh, you know, at an internship before I started back school just a, around a month or two ago. Um, one of the nicest things was that the guy that I was working with who was just... Uh, he was an amazing guy, great preacher, hard worker, and uh, I, I learned a lot from him. And, uh, but it, it was very helpful just to have him to go with me, uh, just because it, it made me feel better. It made me feel more comfortable. I was able to watch him and how he did it. And whenever I made a mistake or whenever I said something that just didn't really make any sense, he was able to help me out. And so we take somebody with us, and that helps a, that helps a ton. Because not only will it do good for you, but it'll do good for the person you take with you too. And so we take somebody with us. If, if, if we're afraid, maybe we can, maybe we can ask uh, uh, the preacher, one of the elders, one of the deacons. Maybe we can ask somebody to go with us, if, if they would go with us on a visit. Uh, go with us to uh, drop something off to somebody. We can do that. Uh, we can do this as well. We can think about Jesus in the garden. You know, you think about Jesus Christ being in the garden of Gethsemane, uh, specifically Luke chapter 22, verse 44. Uh, Jesus, we're told there that he was in agony, yet he prayed more earnestly. And that's, of course, where we're told that his sweat was like uh, great drops of blood. Uh, the agony our Lord went through in the Garden of Gethsemane, I, I don't fully understand it. I, I, don't, I, don't, um, I, I read it, I see it, but I, 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 do not, I cannot adequately, I don't think, convey what that experience was like. I, I think he went through more than we'll probably ever know or understand. You know, and he says there, he says, Lord, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But he says, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So Jesus was in agony. He was absolutely, uh, he was suffering because of what he was about to have to do. And of course, that be go to the cross and die for each and every one of us. Uh, but how did he get over that? Well, he, of course, prayed and he submitted his will to his Father's will. That's what we have to do as well. Uh, we have to, of course, go to the Father in prayer and ask for help. Uh, we have to, again, ask one another for help. Uh, we have to eventually just submit our will to the Father's will. You know, that's the Christian life. Uh, the, the Christian life is continuously uh, saying, not as I will, but as thy will. Because that's, uh, you know, part of repentance is, uh, again, repentance is a continual lifelong thing because it is, uh, once I realize, okay, this action or this behavior is not right, that means I've got to stop that behavior and I've got to align my will with God's will. You know, God has said, uh, don't do this, but do this. Okay, well, I'm doing this, therefore I've got to stop this and do this. Uh, that's me saying, not my will, but thy will be done. Well, we've got to say that exact same thing when it comes to evangelism. You know, uh, I, I, I've, you know, I can't do it because of this, 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 or that, but I've got to say at the end of the day, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thy will. You want me to do this. Jesus Christ has bled and died so that sinners could be saved. Who am I to keep that away from anybody? Uh, we're told in 2 Peter 3, verse 9, 1 Timothy 2, verse 4, that God would have all men everywhere to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Who am I to deny God's will, what He wants for everybody? Uh, who am I to deny that from anyone? And so we have to be willing to say, not as I will, but as thy will. And so we have to allow our love for God and for that person to push away fear. And so what I mean by that is um, just... Now, the two greatest commandments, we're told, are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. And then we're told to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. We see that in Matthew 22, verses 37 to 39. And so we love God, and we remember what He's done for us. That's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. He said, For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And He died for all, so that those who live may no longer live for themselves, but for the sake of Him who died and gave His life for them. So when we realize and remember what Jesus Christ has done for, for every one of us, uh, that should motivate us to want to share that with others. Uh, because that's what God wants us to do. And, and it, it also should, when we think about that person's spiritual condition, uh, you know, one thing that I, that I really, I know I've got to work on and I really struggle with, is whenever I'm driving somewhere and 
and I see somebody just get right on my bumper, it, it frustrates me to no end. I've got my rear view mirror actually turned up to where I can't even see because I'll just sit there and it just it frustrates me. Uh, but I know that's not how a Christian should act. I know that's not how I should be. And so I've tried to and still have a lot of work to do to try and rather focus on what that person is doing wrong. Think about that person as a soul. Uh, think about that person as somebody who's made in the image of God. Think about that person as somebody who Jesus Christ died for. That person needs the blood of Christ just as much as I do. And, and so when we think about somebody like that, it tends to push us towards more of a compassionate attitude towards that person. Uh, we say that person's lost. That person needs Jesus Christ. How can I help that person? We think about Jesus Christ on the cross when he's being crucified. Uh, there at the very end, he says, uh, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He could have stopped it. He could have just wiped every one of them out, and he would have been just in doing so. But he didn't. He allowed his love and pity and compassion for those people to motivate him to do what was best. And that's what we have to do as well for others. We have to love them, and we have to remember that God loved us. We have to remember what God has done for us, and we have to remember that they too need Jesus Christ, and we have to do whatever it takes to bring Christ and share Christ with them. And so, and again, also we pray for help. You know, prayer is something that, uh, that I think is too often and too easily neglected. You know, uh, I heard a preacher one time say this. He said, uh, you know, sometimes we tell people, well, the least I can do for you is pray. Well, you think about that. Is that really the least we can do for somebody? That's asking God uh, to go to work on behalf of another. And I guarantee you God's able to do a whole lot more than me. Prayer is one of the most, if not the most, powerful thing we have from God. It's allowing us to go before the throne of God and to ask Him for help. Uh, you know, right now, if I was to go try and knock on the door of the president's house, well, I probably wouldn't get to the door in the first place. But I guarantee you he wouldn't have any idea who I was and he probably wouldn't care. But God cares. God cares about you. If you're a Christian, even if you're not a Christian, God cares about you, and He showed you that He cares about you by sending His Son to die on the cross. But if you're in Christ, you're a child of God. We see that in 1 John 3, verse 1. He says, See what kind of love that God has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. God wants to hear from His children, and God's ready and willing to help His children. Uh, if we are doing our very best to serve God, to try and take the gospel to others, God's going to help us. God's going to give us more opportunities than we're able to, to, to handle. But we just have to make sure we're ready and we're willing. See, that's God always, God always, He always holds up His end of the deal. Uh, that's what we see in 2 Timothy 2 verse 12, that even when we're faithless, He remains faithful, for He cannot deny Himself. God is faithful. That's one of His attributes. That is something that He cannot help but be. And so when we pray to God and when we ask Him for help for anything... Uh, again, as long as it's in line with His will, uh, especially if we're trying to do something with evangelism, He's going to hold up His end of the deal. He's going to help us. But we've got to make sure that we're doing our best. And so, however, or regardless of what we do to overcome this fear, we still have the responsibility to do. Uh, one of our teachers at school, um, I can't remember when he said this, but he said this, and it's always stuck with me. He said, uh, talking about prayer, he said, don't... Uh, don't pray for a hole and lean on a shovel. Basically, what he, of course, what that means is don't pray for something that, uh, and you just expect God to do it all for you when it's well within our means to, to do it ourselves as well with God. God will help us, but uh, we still have the responsibility to work as well. We still have the responsibility to do. You know, we can pray, Lord, you know, like Jesus tells the disciples, uh, you know, Pray, that, pray to the Lord that He sends more laborers into the harvest. You know, we can pray, Lord, I pray that everybody on earth would become a Christian. Lord, I pray that you would please send more laborers out in the harvest. But uh, maybe we need to say, Lord, please send more laborers out in the harvest and please help me to be the very best laborer I can be for you. And not only should we pray for more laborers, but we should, our, should ourselves be trying to be the best laborer we can be. Uh, we should pray to God that He saves people. And that he gives people the opportunity to, or he gives people the opportunity to hear the gospel. But we should also pray for opportunities to teach the gospel to others. And then we should be ready when those come. James one verse twenty two tells us uh, not to deceive ourselves and being only a hearer of the word, but not a doer. You know, it's it's really easy. And in class, I've noticed that this is something I, I really have to watch out for. Uh, you know, I'm blessed with the opportunity to get to be at a school where I get to learn about the Bible all day long. 
And I'll tell you what, it's easy to, to just learn all that material and to just say, you know what, I, I know this, but doing it's a completely different thing. You know, it's really easy to say, okay, I know this, but now that I know it, what am I going to do about it? You know, knowledge, especially knowledge of the Bible, it does us no good if we don't apply it to our lives. You know, if I have the Bible memorized from cover to cover, but I never apply it to, to my life, or if I never teach it to others, that knowledge does me and nobody else any good whatsoever. Uh, knowledge applied is when that knowledge, or is when that actually will change us and change others. And so we actually have to apply it to our lives. And so another thing we can say, or an excuse we can make for evangelism, and again, all these excuses, these are... These are all things that I, I'm not just, I'm not saying, well, these are all excuses that others make, but I don't make. These are all things that as I was putting this together, these are things that I tell myself sometimes. These are things that I try and tell myself in order to try and get myself, uh, you know, trying to give myself a way out. Uh, you know, fear, that was number one. Number two was I don't have time. Well, uh, that sounds good, but the fact of the matter is if we say we don't have time to evangelize, then our priorities are not in order. Uh, we make time to do whatever it is we want to do. You know, I, uh, I really enjoy, I love college baseball. I love college baseball. Um, you know, I, it's really easy for me to say, well, you know, I don't have time, but I'm going to make time to sit down and watch Mississippi State play baseball. I haven't been able to do that, mainly because I don't, I don't, I don't have any way to, to access the, the stream to watch it. But uh, we make time to watch or do whatever it is we want to do. Uh, evangelism falls in line with that. Uh, Matthew 6, verse 33, we're told there, Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. Of course, there in the context, he's talking about food, clothing, shelter. But the principle of seeking first the kingdom, uh, that's to guide our everyday life. Uh, you know, how is this attitude, how is this action, how is this, whatever it might be, how is it going to affect the kingdom? Is it going to help it or is it going to hurt it? Uh, that should be our mindset and that should be our attitude towards anything and everything. And so if we are too, too busy to evangelize, then we are too busy. You know, I think about Jesus. Um, Jesus, uh, with the woman at the well, in John chapter 4, we see that Jesus, uh, his disciples go off into town, and they go off into town to get food. Uh, Jesus, it, it tells us that he's wearied from his journey. Well, Jesus makes his way uh, over to the well to, uh, to ask the woman for a drink. Of course, the woman tells him, you know, who are you, a Jew, asking me a Samaritan for a drink? But uh, the main thing is, he asked her for a drink, but what, what happened was he wound up forgetting about his needs. He wound up forgetting about that uh, physical thirst that he went there to quench. And what he did instead was he put her needs above his needs. He said, if you would ask, you know, I would have given you living water and you would have never thirsted again. And so he, give, he makes it a spiritual conversation. He starts talking to her about her soul. Uh, he's not worried about, he's like, all right, you know, I'll tell you about this. Just give me some water. Hurry, come on. He's focused on her. He's focused on her work, well-being and her soul. Uh, we see that he continues to talk with her and to share with her about who he is. And, and then the disciples come back. After the woman had uh, went away into town and told everybody about who Christ was, uh, the disciples come back and, and uh, you know, they try and get him to eat. And they, they say, Rabbi, eat. And Jesus says, I have food to eat that you know not of. And about verse 33 of John chapter 4, the disciples, they're uh, asking one another, they're like, who gave him food? How, how does he have food? You know, where, where did this come from? And Jesus says in John verse 34, he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. And so what we see there is we see Jesus' attitude, Jesus' mindset. Uh, Jesus was always focused on doing the Father's will. Uh, Luke 2 verse 52, there where he was a little boy and he was in the temple. His parents come back when they look for him and they find him. He says, did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Um, Jesus was like that his whole life. Uh, John 9 verse 4. You know, Jesus there, we really see the urgency, not only in Jesus' mission, but in our own mission in trying to bring the lost to Christ. Jesus not, or John 9 verse 4, you know, Jesus there tells us that I must work the works of him who sent me while it's day. Soon night is coming where no man can work. See, this is not something that we can continue to put off and to put off and to put off and uh, think, I, I have time, I have time. You know, Jesus Christ is, is just as likely to come today as He is tomorrow. Uh, you know, we, we don't know when He's coming back. Uh, we don't know that date, that time. You know, it could be today, it could be a thousand years from now. 
but the thing is, what are we doing to try and help others uh, when Jesus Christ does come back? What are we doing to try and help others uh, rejoice on that day and not be terrified and afraid on that day? Uh, that's something that uh, it's a very urgent matter, and it's a matter that sometimes, again, speaking of myself here, uh, that it's easy not to have the urgency that we should have towards it. Uh, it's easy to be kind of almost apathetic towards it and say, well, you know, they'll, they'll figure it out on their own. Well, that's not the case. Um, I know I didn't figure it out on my own. Uh, I know I had people that helped me, people that took care of me. Um, and so we have the responsibility to help them uh, to come to Christ. And there's only a very limited amount of time for us and for that individual. And so we have to overcome fear and realize that if we don't go again, who will? You know, this is... If, if we don't go, then who will? I mean, this is something that uh, it, is, it is extremely important. Because uh, if, if we don't teach the truth to others, then nobody else will. The church, is, the church is what God put on earth to go and to teach others, to go and to spread the truth, uh, to go and to uh, you know, help others come to know about Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ has done for every one of us. You know, what's going to make America great again? What's going to make America great again is when there's more knowledge of the Word of God in America. That's what's going to make it great again. And until the church goes and does that, each and every one of us all individually, um, it's never going to be what it needs to be. Hosea 4, verse 6, uh, There we're told, My people are destroyed. Why? For a lack of knowledge. Isaiah 5, verse 13, the prophet there says that, uh, that men are led away or that they were led away into captivity. Why? Because of a lack of knowledge. Whenever there is a lack of knowledge of the Word of God, it will always result in immorality. It will always result in people drifting farther and farther and farther and farther away from God. And the church, part of the responsibility of the church, and every Christian in the church, is to share that knowledge of the Word of God, share the truth with everybody, and to be that light, to be that salt that God would have us to be. And so, uh, point number two, is this class over at uh, 1040 or 1045? I'm sorry. 10, 10, okay. I was making sure because I just realized I'm only on point two and I've only got a few minutes left. Um, so I'm very sorry about that. But point number two is teach. Um, the Great Commission, yeah, point number one is to go. And again, that's everybody's responsibility. That's an action word. Uh, that's a difficult thing, but it's something we all have to do. And it's something that eventually, you know, it becomes easier. Uh, you know, I think about, um, you know, I was talking with somebody about um, studying the Bible and how, um, you know, when I first started uh, studying the Bible, it, uh, and it still can be at times, it's difficult. I remember, I, I, right, I think it was right before I became a Christian, maybe right after, anyway, I had the book of Matthew open on my table in my house, and it, I was like, I'm going to open it, so that way I'm going to read it and look at it. And I'll tell you what, that thing stayed open for quite a while because it was difficult. But, you know, the more you do it, the more you enjoy it. It's kind of like eating vegetables. You know, I, as a kid, I hated vegetables. I, I love them now. Uh, you know, you start to kind of get a taste for them. You start to see how they benefit you, how they help you. Uh, reading the Bible is like that. Teaching others is like that. You know, we, um, at this internship, um, we, we had, the, again, the guy that I worked with, he just was a wonderful guy to get to learn from. And uh, he, he, you know, we went and we taught this woman, and she obeyed the gospel. And it was an exciting thing to see. It was a wonderful thing to see. Uh, she's unfortunately, she's having some family problems now. And if I could ask y'all's prayers, her name is Lynn, Lynn Shepherd. But uh, it was an amazing thing to see because her life just dramatically changed. You know, her family didn't obey the gospel, but she did. Uh, and she started, you couldn't keep her out of that church building. Uh, one night she wasn't able to find a ride, so she walked to the church building. I mean, she was, she was talking to her neighbors. She was trying to convert her whole, uh, her whole subdivision. And she was doing a great job in doing it. She wound up getting us a Bible study uh, with one of her neighbors. But, uh, you know, just seeing that, it's encouraging. It's exciting. Uh, and so the more you do it, the more you're going to want to do it. Uh, the more, again, you study the Bible, well, that applies to just about anything, I think, as far as it's difficult to do sometimes. But you see the benefits. And uh, now, was that the bell for me to stop, or was that the five minutes? Okay. Um, and so we all have the responsibility to try and teach others. And so that's point number two, teach. Point number one was go again. That's an action word for all of us. Point number two is teach. 
And so the Christian has the responsibility to teach, and we all have the responsibility to teach others. Every one of us can learn, uh, you know, how to go through those uh, back to the Bible books. I don't know if y'all have those here, but uh, those are some booklets like uh, like we used with, you know, helping Miss Lynn obey the gospel. Uh, very easy. They they are just laid out perfectly. All you have to do is open up to the uh, book chapter verse, read it, and ask the person the question that's right there in front of you. It is very simple to do, and, and it teaches you a lot as you go through it too. And so, I guess the main point I wanted to make here is, is this: is it's easy to think that evangelism is only for a few specialists, a few people that are trained to go out and to do it. Uh, well, I'm thankful that that's not what the great or the great the good Samaritan thought. You know, the Good Samaritan, after the Levite and the priest had walked past that man who had been beaten by robbers and left there for dead, uh, you know, he didn't stop and say, well, I'm not a trained doctor, therefore I can't do anything to help this man. No, he said, I see a need there and I'm going to do what I can. I may not can do as good of a job as others, but I'm going to do what I can. And so that's exactly what he did. You know, he took care of the man, gave him a place in the inn, told the innkeeper, when I come back, if he uses any more, I'll, you know, I'll take care of it. And that's exactly what we see as well with, uh, you know, when, when Mary anoints, uh, you know, Jesus' head for burial or Jesus' feet for burial. Uh, you know, that perfume, that pure nard, you know, the, the disciples are upset saying this could have been sold and given to the poor. And Jesus says, he says, you know, let her alone. She has done what she could. See, Jesus doesn't expect more from us than what we're able to do. He only expects us to do what we can. And so that's a question I have for me and for all of us here today. Are, are we doing what we can? That individual that might be at our job, that individual that might be in our family, that individual that might be our next door neighbor, am I, are we, doing what we can to try and help that person come closer to Christ? Is it difficult? It is. Is it worth it? Absolutely. You think about what happens to a person when they obey the gospel. That, that, is, that is an eternal weight of good that cannot be measured. That person's eternity is forever changed because of the influence you had in their life and helping them come to know Christ. There is no greater thing you can do in this life than try and teach somebody the gospel and try and help somebody become a Christian. That is the absolute greatest thing you can ever do. And if, you, if we claim to love somebody and not try to teach them, and we can't actually say we love that person. Loving somebody has to involve, if they're outside of Christ, trying to bring them to Christ. And so, again, we cannot make excuses for not teaching. We all have the responsibility to teach. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26, there it's told uh, to Timothy, Paul says, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. And then notice this, able to teach. And so you think about that idea of the Lord's servant. Is there a single Christian that is not a servant of the Lord? There's not. Every single Christian is a servant of the Lord. I'm a servant. You're a servant if you're in Christ. Uh, every single servant has to have that ability to teach others. If nothing else, we can, we can tell others what we did to become a Christian. And so again, we cannot make excuses but we have to make sure we're doing our best if we can't at this time teach somebody to try and learn how to teach somebody. Uh, we can't say that it's not my talent. Again, the Samaritan, you know, he didn't stop from bandaging and helping that man because he said, I'm not a doctor. He, he did what he could. And that's what God expects of us as well. Again, Mark 14, verse 8, that's where you see Mary anointing uh, Jesus and Jesus telling her that, or telling the disciples that she did what she could. And so are, are we doing what we can? Uh, I have one minute and a long way to go. Um, and so I, I, guess I'll just, I guess I'll just close on this because I have a whole other point I didn't get to get to. Um, Jesus in the Great Commission tells us all to go. He tells us all to teach. And He tells us afterwards that we are to continue teaching. Uh, baptism doesn't drown the devil. Uh, if anything, it makes him come after that person even more. You know, before we were a Christian, uh, the devil already had us. But when we become a Christian, he's going to do everything he can to try and get us back. And so if we really care about people, if we really love people, then we're going to do our dead level best, everything we can to try and help those people have the joy that's only found in Jesus Christ. Uh, thank you for your time and your attention.
Good morning. What a beautiful Lord's Day morning God has blessed us with this morning. Amen. Truly really blessed to be able to be here this morning. There's a lot of folks just not as fortunate as we are in some parts of the world to be able to assemble without fear of harm or things happening to them. And we need to keep our brothers and sisters in India there. We know some of the turmoil that's going around in the world this morning. So let us all be thankful and grateful that we can have the opportunity to be here this morning to be in fellowship and to worship God, the true and living God that we serve each and every day. I have several announcements this morning before we begin our worship service. Compassion card team number two will meet this afternoon before worship around 5.15 to 5.30. So if you're on that team, please be here and help fill out the cards. We had a great time yesterday at the men's breakfast, and we thank all the men and those that showed up yesterday, and we appreciate you. And had a great time of fellowship, and we also had a great lesson brought to us from Brother Wayne Lankford, so everything was real good, and we appreciate that opportunity so much. The Friday night singing will be this coming Friday, April the 19th, at the Bethel Congregation in Dunlap. The singing will begin at 7 and refreshments will follow. And if you're interested in going to that singing, be here at the building at 5 o'clock Friday afternoon. Also, this coming Tuesday, April the 16th, the ladies here at the congregation will be going on a ladies' outing, going to Miller's Grocery Cafe in Christiana. Debbie Bryan will be driving the bus and she will be leaving here at 10 a.m. Please sign up in the foyer if you plan to attend. Also, let's all mark our calendars for May the 12th through the 15th. This will be our gospel meeting here at New Union. Our speaker this year will be Brother Glenn Colley. For those of you that have heard Brother Glenn before, you know he's an excellent speaker. And let's all try to make our plans and pencil our schedules in that we can be here and invite somebody to be here with us. Also, I've been asked to announce that on May the 5th that Hay and Tabs are joining forces for an area-wide singing at Short Mountain Bible Camp, and they are calling it Hay Tabs. We will worship at 5 o'clock and have an activity and then share a meal. Please sign up by 426 if you plan to attend or see Brother Mark Williams. There will also be a baby shower for Tori and Travis Jernigan on April 28th from 2 p.m. until 3.30 p.m. They are expecting twin boys and are registered at Amazon. There will be a bridal shower today for Hannah Perry, bride elect of Dayton Graham this afternoon from 2 p.m. until 3.30 p.m. and they are registered at Target, Amazon, and Pampered Chef. Sabrina Gross received a great report this week. She is in remission and tomorrow she will begin chemotherapy for a few times once say, every three to four weeks until they find the perfect bone marrow match. Also, Brother Paul Thornton continues to recover at home after receiving his liver transplant. Brother Doug had mentioned that we need to have a uh, VBS meeting this afternoon at 515. If you can plan on participating in the VBS, please be here at 515. Also encourage each one to come back tonight at six. Tonight will be our singing night so we can all participate in singing praises to God. Johnny Maxwell, which is Amanda Perry's father, is continuing treatments for the next five weeks. Also Paulette Lawson and Winford Sadler have both been moved from the hospital this week and both of those are in NHC in Tullahoma. So Sister Mary Ann Thompson is home recovering from surgery. She had surgery this past Friday. Also Glenn Hewlett is at home this morning not feeling well. And I believe Miss Julia Vaughn is with us this morning and we're glad that she can be here this morning as well. Also we've had a request, prayers requested for Randy Gillum who is undergoing cancer treatments he is the brother-in-law of Carol Gillum. That's all the announcements that I have this evening, this morning. Hope we haven't overlooked anything. A couple more things. 
Brother Charles is away this today through Wednesday at a gospel meeting in Keltenburg, Tennessee. And that meeting will begin tonight at 6 o'clock and each night through the week at 7 o'clock. If anyone has a opportunity and would like to go to that meeting tomorrow night, the bus will leave at 5.30 p.m. if you'd like to go and help support that gospel meeting in Keltenburg. In Brother Charles' absence this morning, we have Brother Sam Lawrence with us this morning. Brother Sam had our Bible class this morning, done an excellent job. Brother Sam has been here several times. He's no stranger to us here at New Union. A little information on Brother Sam. He is now attending the Southeast Institute of Biblical Studies. He will be graduating in May, which is just a few short weeks away. After he completes his graduation, he will be leaving for his work in Australia. He plans on leaving and to go into that work and to be there with a congregation to work there in August. Also, Brother Sam mentioned this morning, I have to tell this on him, how well he loves vegetables and stuff. Well, let me tell you, he loves frog legs too. So he's told us a story last night about his opportunity of getting up to eat frog legs. So he had that opportunity last night during meal. And trust me, he loves frog legs and he can eat them eat a bunch of them. He can hang right in there with me on the eating, I can tell you that. But anyway, we're gonna keep the wireless microphone on him since he ate so many frog legs last night, just in case he gets to, you know, I was talking about frog legs. But I'm sure he'll be good. Are there any other announcements before we begin our worship service this morning? Once again, if you're visiting with us today, we want you to know that we appreciate your presence. And we'll now begin our worship service as we sing praises to God. Yes. The funeral for Billy Bradley's sister will be Monday. The funeral for Billy Bradley's sister will be Monday, tomorrow. Okay. Anything else we may have overlooked? Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. We'll uh, start our song service by singing number 982, We Shall Assemble. Please, let's all sing out this morning. <clears throat> we shall assemble on the mountain. We shall assemble at the throne. With humble hearts into his presence, we bring an Next song will be number 738. We will glorify. And after this song, we'll have a reading and our opening prayer. <clears throat> we will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow. We will worship him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who lives. He is Lord above the universe. All praise to him we give. So hallelujah to the King of kings. Hallelujah to the
Our reading this morning will be from Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. <clears throat> Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another wonderful day that you've given us. Father, especially the time we have this first day of the week to come here to assemble before you and study your words, to sing songs, to praise you and to worship you. Father, as we go through this service, we ask that all things will be done in your name and decently and in order. Father, we ask that you would be with those who have been mentioned here this morning who are sick and to help them to restore to their wanted places in life. We ask you to be with those who have lost loved ones and comfort them. Especially, Father, we ask you to be with those who are trying to spread your word in, in foreign lands, and especially in India with the persecution and turmoil that they have, to be with them, to strengthen them, and give them the courage to get through these troubling times. Father, as we go through this service, be with us, Lord, forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you're following along in the book and you'd like to mark the invitation song, this morning's invitation song will be number 655. At this time we'll sing In Need. And after this song, uh, Brother Sam will come before us and uh, bring us a message from God's Word. This song's a little bit new maybe for some of you. Uh, if it's not new, sing out. And if it is new, catch on here as we sing through these verses. It's a relatively long song, so this will be the last song before the lesson. <clears throat> in need of grace, in need of love, in need of mercy raining down from high above, in need of strength, in need of peace, in need of things that only you can give to me, in need of Christ, the perfect Lamb, my refuge strong, the great I am, this is Good morning. I'll say, like I said in the Bible class this morning, I am very thankful for the opportunity to be here again. Um, I, I can say it, and I said it again, and I'll say it again when I said this morning. This is absolutely 
uh, one of my favorite places to have the privilege to uh, preach at, visit with. Uh, anytime I'm able to come here and see everybody, I, I'm always very thankful. Uh, I've had nothing but just encouragement and just, uh, I've met just some of the nicest, most kind people here I've had the pleasure of meeting. Uh, none the least, of course, being uh, Brother Larry Turner. You know, he is just one of the nicest, best men I've ever met in my life. I mean, I could just go on and on about him. And I'll tell you what, is that, is that how you told me to say it? <laughs> he, uh, <clears throat> no, him, him and Brother Paul and Brother Dennis and Brother Dean, I, I, I mean it, they are. They are just some wonderful people. Uh, I didn't expect Brother Dennis to <clears throat> mention the frog legs. That, that took me by surprise a little bit. Um, he was, he was, him and Larry were talking about the frog legs last night and, uh, and about having to put the lapel mic on me just in case I started hopping around. And, uh, and brother, uh, brother Dennis, he said, he said, well, just don't croak and we'll be all right. And I said, yeah, it's, it's not my plan or my intention to. But, um, but no, I, I very much do. I appreciate and I've, I, I'm so very thankful to be here and, and thankful for all that y'all have done for me. Y'all are such an encouragement to me. And brother Mike, too, I got the opportunity to go to Camp Short Mountain. Uh, last year, and it was, uh, I, I enjoyed it too. It was a great time. Uh, but anyway, uh, thankful to be here and, and thankful for the opportunity to be before you all this morning. Uh, and so, Matthew 16 24 was the scripture reading, and so that's uh, exactly what we're going to look at this morning. Uh, Jesus said uh, that if we are to be his disciples and we are to take up our cross and deny ourselves and follow him. And so, that's exactly what we're going to be talking about this morning. We're going to be talking about the life of self denial. Uh, we're going to be talking about how we can do that and examples we see in the Scripture, in the scripture that, uh, that show us how we are to live that life. But before we get started this morning, would you please bow with me for a quick word of prayer? Dear all-knowing and all-powerful and ever-present, God and Father in heaven, Heavenly and Holy Father, we are so very thankful for the pleasure and the privilege you've given us, Father, to again have the opportunity to be a part of your family, a part of your church, to know that uh, Father, we can cast all our cares before you and know that you care for us and that you hear us and to know that you love us and that you have given us your word by which we can study and know more about who you are and know more about what you've done for us and know about how we can be more like Christ and uh, to know how we can live a faithful life so one day we can live with you forever, Father. Father, we're thankful for your Son and we're thankful for the life in which he lived and, and we're thankful for his willingness to sacrifice himself on the cross for us. Father, as we come to you, we ask that you would help us as we study your word to have eyes that see, ears that hear, and a heart that's open to your word, and help us to diligently strive to apply your word to our lives, to uh, think about your word, to study your word, so that we can know how to uh, rightly live the life you've given us, and to know how we can live this life best for you. Father, help us in all that we do, and in this time, to strive to glorify you always. Father, we love you, and we're thankful for all that you've done for us. It's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. So also what Brother Dennis said this morning, um, just about the opportunity we all have to be here, to assemble together. Uh, we have the, the health to be here. We have the opportunity to be here. And that is, uh, that's such a blessing. You know, it's easy sometimes to just assemble Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and it just be uh, something you do. You know, it's uh, just something, it becomes a habit. Uh, but it's a privilege. It's a blessing. Uh, being a Christian and being part of the Lord's church is without a doubt absolutely positively the best thing you can ever hope to have this side of heaven. You know, I don't know much, and if you ask anybody from school, they'll probably agree with you. But being a Christian is without a doubt the greatest gift God has ever given us. And it's a wonderful thing to be able to assemble together and worship with one another. And so, Matthew 16, beginning in verse 24. Matthew 16 beginning in verse 24. And we'll look at verse 21 just to get the context and just kind of to get the idea of what's going on here. And so beginning in verse 21 of Matthew chapter 16, it says, From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. And he must suffer many things from the elders, from the chief priests, and the scribes, and to be killed, and on the third day be raised. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And so when I began to put this together, I, I thought about a story um, that uh, 
uh, I guess would kind of illustrate the point here, uh, not necessarily exactly, but uh, basically what happens when we don't listen to those who are really just trying to tell us what to do and what not to do because they care about us, because they want what's best for us. Uh, when I was about 15 or 16 years old, um, one of my buddies and me, we went uh, fishing uh, back home in Mississippi. And for some reason or another, my dad let me borrow his bass boat. Of course, this was before I was a Christian. Um, this was well before I was a Christian, but uh, my dad let me borrow his bass boat. His only rule was, he said, whatever you do, don't crank up the big motor. Well, that, uh, of course, I did just what he said don't do. And so me and Cole, my buddy, we got out in the bass boat. We cranked up the big motor. We made a couple laps around the lake. And I think we forgot something in the truck. And so we came back up on the bank. Uh, I you know, drove the, the boat back up on the bank where we could uh, get something out of the truck real quick. And uh, I didn't realize that the, the bass boat was so low in the back that I had pulled it up on such an angle to where uh, water started coming into the back of the boat. And so as we were at the truck getting some out of the truck, water was just steadily coming into the back of the boat to the point where it just pulled it on into the water and the boat sank. And so then we were really in trouble. So I had to call my dad and tell him I, I sunk his boat, and, and, uh, and uh, the good friend Cole was, when my dad showed up, he disappeared. And so uh, <laughs> that's to illustrate this, that uh, whenever, uh, you know, I, I didn't deny myself. My dad, he gave me the opportunity to show a little bit of responsibility and to, you know, use his bass boat and to do something that I couldn't believe he let me do, but I, I ruined it. I messed it up because I didn't deny myself. I said, I'm going to do what I want to do. And I got myself in a lot of trouble as a result of doing that. And so is it the case that sometimes, you know, if we're a Christian here today, that when we refuse to deny ourselves and to do what God has told us to do or not to do, uh, do we usually wind up getting in trouble as a result of that? We do. We always do. We always will. God has given us His Word and His commandments to help us. You know, Jesus has not told us anything to do that He has not done Himself. And everything He has told us to do is only for our good. And so, there are consequences when we refuse to deny ourselves and live for God. And so, point number one is just going to be simply this. Satan seeks to sabotage self-denial. And so, what do I mean by that? Well, when we go back to Matthew chapter 16 and we look at verses 21 and following, we see there that uh, Jesus had just said that, uh, you know, that he was going to have to deny himself, that he was going to have all of these things done to him. Uh, but Peter, because he was setting his mind on the things of man rather than the things of God, he said, far be it from you, Lord, this is never going to happen to you. And Jesus rebukes Peter and says that, that he is a hindrance to him. He says, get behind me, Satan. And so Satan can use many things to teach or to tempt every one of us, uh, again, if we're in Christ, every one of us, to do what we want rather than what God wants. And well, and this is even valid if we're not a Christian. Because Satan can do whatever he can to tempt us from or to try and get us not to obey the gospel if that opportunity presents itself. And so Satan used Peter to tempt Christ not to obey God. Uh, and Satan doesn't want us to live for God, but he wants us to live for ourselves. And so Satan can use our friends. He can use our family, again, to keep us from obeying God. And again, he can uh, even keep us from obeying the gospel or because of family members or friends. For example, um, you know, say that, um, say that your family members uh, you know, are, are not Christians. And say you become a Christian and, and that puts uh, you know, a, a huge uh, divide, a huge source of tension between you and your family. Uh, when I became a Christian, I'm, I'm the only Christian in my family. My, my family are not Christians. Uh, and so when I became a Christian, that, that put a, uh, a pretty good spot of tension there between me and my family. Uh, but whatever comes at us in this life, whatever tries to keep us from obeying the gospel or tries to keep us from doing what God would have us to do, we cannot let anything come between us and obeying God. We always have to do what God wants us to do, regardless of the consequences, regardless of what may or may not happen to us. Every single one of us has to be willing to do whatever it takes to obey God, whether that's obeying the gospel or whether that's just doing what's right uh, in a world that very greatly wants us to do what's wrong. And so Satan does not want us, again, to live for God before ourselves. 
And so we see this in a lot of areas. Um, I'm not going to be able to mention all the areas or else I'd, I'd keep you all here long, uh, a lot longer than you all would like to. But uh, peer pressure is one of those areas. You think about the area of peer pressure, that's, that's a very real thing. Um, I remember uh, before I was a Christian, um, a guy that I used to work with uh, when I was in college, he, uh, he was a Christian. And so he didn't go and do all the things that I did. He didn't run with all the people that I ran with, and I, I made fun of him for it. Gave him a hard time because of it. Uh, because the, the truth is, he, he convicted me by the life he chose not to live. It convicted me of the life I was living. And so I wanted him to do what I, what I did so that way it would make me feel better. But he didn't. And because of his example, you know, I'm here today. Had it not been for him doing what was right rather than doing what I did, I may not be here today. And so peer pressure is a real thing, but a peer pressure is something we cannot give into, whether young, whether old. Every single time you give into peer pressure, and that's doing something that God does not want you to do, but something you choose to do to fit in, to be cool, to be like everybody around you, it's always a mistake. It is always going to hurt you, and it will never, in any case, help you. You know, Jesus goes on to say after Matthew verse, uh, 16, verse 24, He said, "...what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his soul?" What will man give in return for his soul? And the answer to that is nothing. And so, the areas of this peer pressure, well, there's, again, a lot. But the ones I thought of that are extremely uh, prominent in our world today are, number one, it's this. Uh, do this to fit in. Well, that's sexual sin. Uh, we live in a world today where uh, sexual immorality, uh, sex before marriage, um, even, uh, you know, going from person to person to person, even if you are married, you know, it's becoming more and more accepted today. But it has never been the way God would have it to be. It has never been in line with God's will. Uh, just because the majority says it's okay, often, it probably often means that it's not okay. Um, sexual immorality is something we see in our world today. And, and again, it's prominent in our world today. It's something that um, again, whether young or old, you're going to come under the, um, the influence of or, or or you're going to come within its sphere of influence. You know, maybe it's something your friends are caught up in. Maybe it's something that's just normalized, uh, uh, whether on a baseball team, football team, sports team, uh, cheerleading, whatever it might be. Uh, the point is, it is something that, that you're going to come within the sphere of influence, uh, probably of, if you haven't already. But it's not something that God would have us to do. It is completely against the will of God. And again, just because it's popular, just because somebody says to do it, does not mean it's right. Um, you think about the faithful uh, in the Old Testament, for example. You know, Noah and his family, they chose to do what's right, and the whole world was doing what's wrong. Were they in the minority or the majority? They were in the minority. Uh, you think about Lot and his family leaving Sodom. Were they in the minority or the majority? They were in the minority. Uh, well, you think about... You know, the day of Pentecost, you know, you have 3,000, which, which is a lot, who chose to become members of the church. Were they in the minority or the majority? Well, likely there were millions of people there on the day of Pentecost. They were in the minority. See, Christians have always been and probably will always be in the minority. And so just because people are doing something, it does not give us a license to do it. But rather, we are to always follow and do what God would have us to do. And, and number one of that is to abstain from sexual immorality. Uh, sex is something that God made for a man and a woman who are in a, a marital marriage relationship. It's not for anybody and everybody. It's not for uh, just to go out and do it whenever you feel like or whenever you want. It, it is something that God has made specifically for marriage. And so, whatever this world might try and convince us of, if it tries to convince us of anything other than that, then it's not true. And so, that is one area of peer pressure that the world will try and make us conform to. But again, Romans 12, verse 2, we're told there. We're told to not be conformed, but to be transformed. How? By the renewing of our mind. And so, rather than made like the world, we're to be made like Christ. And hopefully, our influence will make other people more like Christ, or we'll bring other people to Christ. But the only thing we do when we try to fit in is we hurt ourselves and we hurt any positive influence we could have on other people. And so maybe another peer pressure we could come under is, um, you know, you think about the area of drugs, you know, uh, smoke this, take this, do this. Uh, well, again, that's another area that's, uh, you know, popular to the world. 
uh, popular to those who are outside of Christ and, and might be becoming more popular to those who are in Christ. Uh, the only thing drugs will do is they will, uh, they will cover up the problem that you refuse to address. Uh, whatever problem that you might be dealing with that you may not want to address, you may not want to uh, face, uh, you're just going to try and hide from reality. Therefore, you're going to take drugs. Therefore, you're going to drink alcohol. Therefore, you're going to uh, do anything and everything that might cause just an ounce, a little bit of pleasure to keep you away from that. But it's never going to satisfy. It's always going to leave you more empty than, than when you first started. You know, you look at the book of Ecclesiastes and you read through there, you can see Solomon. You know, Solomon, uh, he gave his life to all of those things. And he says, at the end of the day, all of it's vanity. But he says in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13, he says, this is the whole of man. What's that? Fear God and keep His commandments. That is the whole duty of man. And that's the only way that we can live a happy and a joyful life. Now, does that mean that it's always going to be easy? It doesn't. But that is the only way you can live a fulfilling life to where you have hope, which is something that, that nothing in this world can give you apart from God. Drugs, alcohol, money, pleasure of any and every kind, none of it can give you that. Only God in a proper relationship with Him can give you that. And so, sexual sin, drugs, and then you have this idea of uh, alcohol or social drinking. You know, this idea of drink this in order to fit in. Well, again, this is another popular thing. It's something that... You know, you look at the, uh, the media today, you look at commercials today, and it's, it's peddled as though alcohol is no big deal. As though if you want to be somebody to fit in, then you need to drink alcohol. Well, I used to believe that too before I was a Christian. My, my mom and my dad, they're, they're both alcoholics. Um, that's something I grew up thinking was normal. That's something I grew up thinking that this is just something everybody does, but that's not true. The truth is that that kind of thing will, uh, what it'll do is it'll ruin a family. Uh, it'll ruin somebody's life. Uh, but you don't see that on any of the commercials. You don't see the lives that it's ruined. You don't see the families that it's ruined. You don't see the people that it's hurt. You don't see that on any of the commercials. Uh, you don't see the alcoholics that are trying to get away from this thing that has just, well, it's put them, it's enslaved them. It's what it's done. Uh, you don't see that uh, on the commercials, but you see this wonderful, dr this wonderful dramatized life of uh, people who are indulging in alcohol. You know, it's, they just have the best life ever. But that's not true. Alcohol has, uh, I, I think alcohol is single-handedly just about, I can't think of anything else that may have had a, more of an impact, ruined more homes than anything I can think of at the present moment. Uh, you think about the destructive nature of alcohol and what it does to an individual, what it does to a family, and of course what it would do to a Christian. Uh, and Of course, uh, it would cause a Christian to fall away from fellowship with God is what it would do first off. And there's so many other things that it would cause a Christian to do as well. But it's one of those things that has been popularized again by the media. But when we look to the Scriptures and what the Scriptures has to say about it, it's a completely different story. Uh, Proverbs 20 verse 1, you know, is one that comes off the top of my head. You know, you think of uh, wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler. Whoever is led, away, led astray by it is not wise. Um, you look at the, uh, the Scriptures... And the picture it paints about alcohol, you, you, for example, you look at, um, you look at Noah. Uh, right after Noah had, had come to land, gotten off the ark, plants a vineyard, well, he gets drunk. And then you look at what his children did, or well, excuse me, one of his children. Uh, well, you look at the result that had. It wasn't positive. Well, you look at the result of Lot. Lot's daughters, they got him drunk. You look at what happened to that. Uh, alcohol is something that the Christian should never engage in. Uh, you, think about, uh, you think about one good reason why the Christian should engage in alcohol. I don't think you can find one. Uh, but you can find a whole lot of reasons why the Christian should not. Uh, influence. Uh, you know, you try and uh, have a beer with somebody and teach them the gospel, it's going to be really hard to do. Uh, alcohol and the Christian are something that should never mix together. But again, it's something the world tells you is normal. It's something the world tells you is okay. It's something the world tells you, if you want to be somebody, you need to do this. Well, that's a lie. That is an absolute lie. And then you have this other area, the area of modesty. You know, wear this if you want to fit in. Uh, wear this if you want to be cool, if you want to be popular. Um, well, this idea of modesty, again, this is an area where uh, the world says this is normal, but you look to the Scriptures and you see something completely different. Uh, see, uh, a man should not be attracted to a woman because of what that woman wears and how it makes her body look. 
Uh, if, if that's the reason a man is attracted to a woman, then that man is attracted to the woman for, for the wrong reason. Um, the person should be what attracts the man or the woman. Uh, it should be about who that person is, that person's character. Uh, is that person going to help me to go to heaven or not? Is that person going to help my children, Lord willing, later on going go to help, go to heaven or not? Uh, but this area of modesty, it's, it's something that uh, seems to, of course, it's rampant in the world, but it seems like it's even penetrated the church as well. You know, this idea of uh, wear uh, whatever everybody else wears, and, and it's okay, but that's, again, that's not the way the Scriptures would have it. Uh, you think about this. Uh, if Jesus was sitting right next to me, would He be pleased with what I'm wearing? Uh, could I stand before God with what I'm wearing and, and, and be comfortable with it? Um, I've heard, uh, and that's, again, this is for men and women. Um, I've heard a preacher say this, and it's, you know, it's uncomfortable to say, and it's probably going to be uncomfortable to hear, but it conveys the truth. He said, um, if, if your clothes are so tight that uh, the only thing a person, man or woman, has to do to imagine you without those clothes is just to change the color of your clothes to the color of your skin, then those clothes are too tight. Well, that's true. Uh, again, what am I trying to prove by how I wear? Does what, does what I'm wearing say that I'm a Christian or does it say something else? You think of uh, Judah and Tamar. Uh, Judah, when he was going in, uh, or when Tamar uh, went to go trick Judah, uh, since she hadn't, or since Judah hadn't given her uh, his son to have children, uh, Tamar put on the clothes of a harlot. Uh, so something about what she wore said something about who she was. And so Judah, seeing what she was wearing, uh, stopped on the side of the road and basically, you know, said some suggestions to her. And you know, uh, we of course know the rest that Judah went into Tamar, and Tamar bore a son by Judah. But the point is this, something about what she wore said something about who she was and her character. Well, what are we, and what are we wearing, what does that say about our character? What does that say about who we are? What am I trying to attract by what I'm wearing? Because whatever I'm trying to attract, more than likely I'm going to attract. And so, modesty, again, another area where the world says, uh, you know, basically just, just tries to sexualize every single thing we wear, but... Again, God would not have it be that way. God would not have it be that way. And again, so we talked about sexual sin, drugs, alcohol, social drinking, modesty, and uh, I realize that I've only probably touched the hem of the garment on any of these because there's so much more that could be said. But we're going to talk about now Satan's methods. Satan's methods. How does Satan, get, how does Satan try and sabotage self-denial? Uh, well, you think about the lust of the eyes. Well, this is simply what looks good. The lust of the flesh, what feels good. Uh, pride of life, what makes me look good. Uh, you go back to the garden, Genesis 3. Uh, Eve saw the fruit and saw that it, was, uh, saw that it looked good. And so there you have the lust of the eyes and uh, saw the lust of the flesh again, saw that it was, looked good for food, and then it was desired to make one wise, and there's the pride of life. You know, it would make me look good. But notice all of these temptations, all of these things that Satan can use. Uh, all of these revolve around self. You know, all of these are about me. Uh, what makes me look good? What, what do I think or what do I want? Well, the life, the life that is uh, focused on self or um, the life that's self-centered, I guess is a better way of putting it, the life that's self-centered is off-centered. If my life is focused on me, then it's not focused on what it needs to be. It needs to be focused on God and how I can serve Him. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so, setting my thoughts on the ways of man and not on the ways of God, that is always going to result uh, in me not being where I need to be. Again, going back to those, those sins, those things that the world will say is normal. Uh, those things that everybody else is doing. Well, it's not about what everybody else does. It's about what God has said. And so, we look at, you know, what does the Bible say about uh, when I try and do things the way that I think is right? Well, Proverbs 14, verse 12, and 16, verse 25 says, uh, There's a way that seems right to man, but its end is death. Uh, Jeremiah 10, verse 23. We see there it says, I know, O Lord, the way of man is not within himself, that it's not within man who walks to direct his steps. That basically means that apart from God's Word, I have no idea what I need to be doing. You know, God's Word is called a lamp and a light. Psalm 119, 105. Thy Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. If I want to know where I'm going in this life, if I want to be able to uh, miss and not be tripped up by the snares of the enemy, well, I've got to have the light of God's Word or else I'm going to be walking in darkness. 
else I'm going to trip and stumble over every single thing that the devil puts before me. We have a great example of this in Matthew chapter 4. When Jesus is being tempted by the devil, what does he say over and over and over again? It is written. It is written. It is written. Had he not known what was written, well, it might have been easier or would have been easier for the devil uh, to convince him that he was right. It's the same way with us. We have to know what God's Word says. Not what I think, not what I feel, but what God's Word says. Uh, Satan is good at what he does, and he is resilient. Uh, 1 Peter 5 verse 8 says that the devil is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And he's resilient. We can, get, we can know this. If, if we're not working, he is. And so we don't need to think that the devil is no big deal, that you know, he's just this uh, red cartoon character that sometimes we see portrayed uh, you know, with a pitchfork in his hand and a long pointy tail. Just like God wants what's absolutely best for us, the devil wants what's absolutely worse for us. The devil wants you and I in hell. And he's going to do every single thing he can to bring that about. So if that means we're giving him the advantage by not studying the Bible, not living how God would have us to live, he's going to take advantage of that. And he's going to make sure that we wind up as far away from God as we can. But we can, uh, we can either choose to allow him to do that or we can fight against that. Uh, he's older and wiser than us all. However, 1 John 4 verse 4 tells us this. It says that he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So on our own, can we overcome him? No. But with God, we can. That's why Philippians 4 verse 13, you know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, that doesn't mean that I'm going to be able to go out to the baseball field and hit a home run. That doesn't mean I'm going to be able to throw a football 70 yards. I wish I could, but I can't. Uh, but that does mean every single thing that I need to be able to do to stay faithful to God, God will always help me to be able to do that. And so resisting the devil, resisting sin, being one of those, living a life of self-denial, God will give me the strength to do that. But I've got to try. And so we have to walk in the light to avoid the snares of the devil. Uh, we have to walk in the wisdom of God's Word. And we have to resist the devil and to submit to the Master. That's James 4 verse 7. Now, there we're told to resist the devil and he will what? He will flee from you. And we have to submit to God and resist the devil. And so Satan used Peter to try and cause Jesus to fall. Uh, Peter later, later would deny Jesus three times. Uh, and you see the end of that, that Peter would go out and he would whip bitterly. Uh, you think about Judas. Uh, Judas would deny Jesus. Uh, Judas would give Ju Jesus over to be betrayed. Uh, you think about what was his end. What, what did he reap as a result of uh, doing what he wanted to do? You know, indulging in uh, getting those 30 pieces of silver for Jesus Christ. Well, Mark 14, verse 21, it says, uh, or excuse me, I think I put down the wrong passages. Uh, but either way, we see, that Jesus, or we see that Judas went back to the temple. He tried to throw those uh, silver coins before those that gave them to him. And he said that he had done wrong. But they didn't care. You know, they, they just wanted Jesus. Uh, we see that Judas wound up going out and he, he hung himself. Uh, you think about the bitter end of him because he didn't live for God, but he did what he wanted to do. You think about the bitter end of Peter. again, or Thankfully, Peter was given the opportunity to repent. But you think about Peter when he denied Jesus three times. He went out and he bitterly wept. Uh, the point being, every time we choose to do what we want to do rather than what God wants us to do, it, it'll always end up in bitterness. It'll always end up in weeping. It'll always end up in something we don't want. And so, of course, this is the end of those who live for themselves. And death is just the beginning of the pain they'll experience. Revelation 14.11 is probably one of the most sobering and uh, difficult passages to read and to think about. But it tells us that uh, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, those who worship the beast and follow him. Basically, those who decide to live a life apart from God, that that will be their end. The, their end will be in an eternal hell. Uh, something none of us want to want to see, something none of us want of ourselves or for anyone we love, but... If we choose to live for ourselves rather than to live for God, that'll be our end. And that'll be where we wind up. And so point number two, we talked about the uh, Satan seeks to sabotage self-denial. In a few ways he'll do that. Uh, point number two, we're going to look at this. Uh, the master's model of self-denial. You know, who, who has given us the best model of self-denial? Well, it's Jesus Christ. It's the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. It is... Uh, the one that we've been singing about, that perfect lamb, 
Uh, you know, Jesus Christ, the one who suffered and bled and died for every single person here. Uh, that's our perfect example. We see that in 1 Peter 2, verse 21. He's our perfect example that we should be trying to follow. And so Jesus gives us the perfect example of a life of self-denial. Uh, Jesus denied himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. We see that in Philippians 2, verse 8. Uh, Jesus wanted another way, but he submitted to God and he denied himself. Uh, we talked about that a little bit in class this morning. Uh, Jesus in the garden, uh, Luke 22, verse 44. You think about the agony he was in and all that he was going through, but he said, nevertheless, not as I will, but thy will. Uh, and he gave in to God's will rather than his will, and he submitted to God. And he denied himself and did what God would have him to do. And so, though he was in agony, yet he denied himself for you and for me. And so, you think about that, and that, that, really is the, that really is the most powerful motivator to deny ourselves. You know, someone might say, well, why do I have to do this? Why do I have to give this up? Uh, why can't I do the things that I've always done? Well, because Jesus Christ denied himself for you and me, and he died for you and me. And so, if we want to live with him one day, that means we're going to have to do what he's told us to do. And it's always best for us. It's always, he just wants what's best for us. And so, because Jesus Christ denied Himself for us, we ought to be willing to deny ourselves for Him. So Jesus is our perfect example, 1 Peter 2, verse 21. Uh, if we are to come after Him, which literally, uh, the word Christian means a follower of Christ. If we are to follow Christ, if we are to follow after Him, that means we are to live our lives the way He would want us to live. And so, that means we are to deny ourselves. Uh, we might have to deny ourselves popularity. We may not be one of the most popular people at our school, at our job. Um, you fill in the blanks wherever we might be. Uh, you, you know, you think about privilege. We have to deny ourselves privilege, uh, meaning uh, denying ourselves for God and for one another, uh, meaning we are to serve one another. You know, Mark 10, verse 45, Jesus there said, The Son of Man came not to serve, or to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. And so Jesus Christ, if He was willing to serve, to die for me, if He was willing to wash feet, uh, who am I to say I'm above any act of service? Uh, we are to deny ourselves privilege in serving one another, meaning to humble ourselves. And Philippians 2, 3 through 4 tells us that we are to consider others as more important than ourselves. And so Christ didn't surrender to Satan, but rather He submitted to God. Again, we see that in Matthew chapter 4. Uh, those multiple temptations that Jesus went through, rather than giving in to those temptations, He surrendered to God. He did what God would have Him to do rather than what Satan would have Him to do. Uh, he didn't listen to Peter, but He listened to God, and He denied Himself like we all should. And so, the Master submitted Himself, talking about Jesus Christ, to the point of death. And again, you, just, you try and think about that and wrap your mind around that. Uh, Jesus Christ, uh, Philippians 2, 6 through 8, you know, tells us that though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking on the form of a man, being born in the likeness of, or taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even point of death on the cross. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, not only left heaven, came to this world, not only served rather than not, or rather, not only served us rather than to be served, but He died on the cross for every single one of us, for our benefit, so that we could have the life that He wants us to have, so that we could live with Him in heaven one day. You know, He went through all of that for us. And so we should be willing to do whatever it takes to live the life He would have us to live. And so the Creator of the universe denied Himself for us uh, so that we might do the same for Him. And so finally, uh, point number three is the Christian's commitment to self-denial. Uh, number one, again, was Satan seeks to sabotage self-denial, uh, meaning, of course, if you try and do what's right, Satan's going to try and make sure you do what's wrong. Uh, point number two was the master's model of self-denial. How can we look at Jesus and learn how to deny ourselves? Uh, point number three is the Christian's commitment to self-denial, meaning that when you and I are baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, when we put on Christ in baptism, uh, when we're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, that, that literally means that we're baptized into their possession, meaning that I am no longer mine, but I belong to Christ. Uh, meaning that the life of self-denial means that it's no longer me doing what I want to do, but it's about me doing what God wants me to do. 
You know, we're called servants, we're called slaves. The, the idea of a bond servant just means that one who has sold himself into the service of another, meaning somebody voluntarily giving themselves over to the service of another. Of course, in our case, that being Jesus Christ. And so, to become a follower of Christ means a life of self-denial. You know, we are baptized into Christ, meaning we belong to Him. Uh, we see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19-20. through 20. And there Paul tells us that, uh, that, it's, that I don't belong to myself. That, <clears throat> excuse me, that my body is not mine. I don't belong to myself. It's no longer what I want to do, but uh, rather my body is to be to glorify God. I am to live my life for that reason, to glorify God. Uh, to be a bondservant of Christ or a slave of Christ means we no longer live for ourselves, but uh, it means we rather live for Him, Jesus Christ, and we live a life of self-denial. Uh, Galatians 2 verse 20, you think about the Apostle Paul and what he said. Uh, Galatians 2 verse 20, Paul says there that, uh, he says, I've been crucified with Christ. Well, you think about that, does that mean he was literally crucified with Christ? Well, of course, we know that's not the case. But what he means is that I've died to myself. When Christ died, I died. I don't do what I want to do anymore, but I do what Jesus Christ would have me to do. But Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. And so Paul lived for Christ. Uh, Philippians 1 verse 21, Paul there says that, uh, you know, that for him to live is Christ and to die is gain. The very essence of who Paul was is Christ. Uh, Paul lived a Christ-centered life, and that should be the life we seek to live as well. And then as, as we come to a close, um, these are my two favorite verses in Scripture probably. Uh, these two verses to me probably, and uh, at least to me, they, they seem to encapsulate the Christian life better than anywhere else I can find. Of course, that doesn't mean that it's not there. It just means that I don't, I'm not aware of it. Which, uh, but 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. You know, there the Apostle Paul, he says this, For the love of Christ controls us. It, it constrains us, meaning every single thing we do, uh, coming to worship, denying ourselves, giving up those things I used to do, but I don't do them anymore. Uh, the love of Christ is what causes me to do that. Realizing that Jesus Christ left heaven, came to earth, was crucified on a cross, died, was buried, resurrected, all of that just so I could have life and a home in heaven, uh, realizing that He did that for me causes me to live for Him. But anyway, Paul says, For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one, Jesus Christ, has died for all. Therefore, all have died. Uh, see, Jesus dying for all means that, that I've died to myself when I become a Christian. It means that I'm going to live for Jesus Christ. And he said that all have died. And so when Christ died and I accepted and I obeyed the gospel, that means I died to myself so that I could live for Christ. And so Jesus Christ loved us and died for us again so that we would live for Him. And so if we truly love Christ and follow Him, then we will deny ourselves and live for Him who died for us. And so when you think about it, how could we do anything less? Uh, when you think about the great sacrifice of Jesus Christ, how could we do anything less than deny ourselves and live for Him. There has never been, nor will there ever be, a greater act of love than Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins. 1 John 4 verse 9, we're told that in this, the love of God was made manifest. Meaning, we can see God's love in one singular point in history. Knowing without a shadow of a doubt that He loves us. When was that? Well, that's the cross. You know, no matter what we might be going on, going on in our life, we might say, well, does God really care about me? Does God really love me? We don't have to wonder that. We look to the cross and we can know without a shadow of a doubt that He does. And that, that, that act of love and what Christ did for us, that should motivate us to not only give our lives to Him, but to live the rest of our lives for Him. That is the greatest motivation in the Christian, Christian life is the cross. That's the greatest motivation to become a Christian, the cross. That's the greatest motivation to give up whatever you might be keeping you from becoming a Christian is the cross. And if that won't convince you, then nothing else will. Jesus Christ died for us, again, so that we would live for Him. And so, uh, finally, as we close, uh, which I know I just said that, but uh, finally, really, as we close, you think about this. You know, Jesus Christ, all that He went through, He could have stopped it at any time. You know, I think I've mentioned this before, but it's something that, that I always think about. Um, 
Jesus Christ could have stopped what He was going through at any time. You know, He could have called 10,000 angels. We sing that song sometimes. But He didn't. You know, He could have stopped all the pain, all the suffering, all the agony, all the shame, but He didn't. And why didn't He? Why, why wouldn't He have stopped it? He would have been just in doing so. He wouldn't have been doing wrong. He didn't do it. And He didn't stop it because of you and because of me. Because He loved us. Because He wants us to live with Him in heaven one day. He wants us to be faithful unto death. He wants us to become a Christian if we have yet to become one. That's why He didn't stop it. That's why He didn't call 10,000 angels, because of us. And so how can we not live for somebody who has loved us so much? The greatest act of human history, Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins. That should far and away motivate us to live for Him and to give our lives to Him. And so if we submit to the schemes of the devil, uh, then we cannot live for Christ. If we do not follow the model of the Master, then we cannot live for Christ. If we do not understand the Christian's commitment, then we cannot live for Christ. If we try and salvage our lives and live for ourselves, then we will lose our lives. Uh, we might live a life that some people would say is, um, is a great life here and now, but ultimately in eternity, in eternity uh, we will ultimately lose because uh, we'll suffer eternal punishment rather than eternal life. And so, um, one of my favorite preachers said this, and, and it kind of helps understand the idea of self-denial. He says this, he says, He who lives to himself and dies to himself, to himself there is none besides, but he must live as though Christ never lived and die as though Christ never died. Basically, that says this, if, if I choose to live how I want to live, then I'm not going to benefit from the death of Christ. If I choose to live for me, myself, and I, uh, then I'm not going to benefit from the death of Christ here nor after. And so we can all make that decision to either live for Christ or to live for ourselves. but that's something uh, you have to make for yourself and I have to make for myself. And so if you live for yourself, you'll die without Christ and you'll be separated from Him for eternity. Uh, we're told that sin is what separates us from death. We see that in Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, 11 and 12 tells us that, uh, that we're separated from God and we're without hope and without God in the world. But verse 13 says, Thanks be to God that through Christ Jesus, by His blood, we're brought back into fellowship with God. But until we obey the gospel, and until we choose to uh, do what it takes to become a Christian, we're separated from God. We can either choose to live that way, to stay that way, or we can choose to become a Christian. And so Jesus Christ made the invitation uh, for everyone when He says, whosoever will. He says, whosoever will uh, live for me, let him deny himself. And so Jesus Christ, He made the invitation again for anyone for any, and for everyone when He said, whosoever will. And so this morning, are you at this moment following Christ? Are you at this moment a Christian? Are you at this moment living your life uh, the way you know God would have you to live it? Because if you're not, I would ask why not. Uh, I don't know of a single, and there's not. There's not one single logical reason for you to stay outside of Christ and for you to live your life contrary to Christ. Uh, God loves you, and He loves you more than anyone ever will or ever has. God wants what's best for you more than anyone or anything. And the best life this side of heaven is the life of a Christian. The only thing you'll find outside of a Christian life is you'll find misery. You'll find sadness. You'll never find hope. You'll never find fulfillment. The Christian life is the only life that you can live here to have any of those things. And ultimately, really, being a Christian is the entire purpose of life. If we're to live life to glorify God, you can't do that outside of Christ. The Christian life is the only life you can live this side of heaven to enjoy life and to really enjoy it. And so if you're not in Christ this morning... Uh, Again, I would ask and urge you and beg you to become a Christian before you, leave this, before you leave this building. If you're outside of Christ, I would again ask, urge, and beg you to make your life right before you leave this building. You and I don't know when our last day is. You and I don't know when Christ is coming. The worst thing that could ever possibly happen to you or I is when we die or when Christ comes back to be outside of Christ. Because at that time, we won't have hope. Uh, we won't be able to say, I've made a mistake, let me change. No, that's the time for change and the time to become a Christian has already left. The only thing we have is an eternity to spend in hell. That eternity will never cease. And that punishment will never stop. And so if we 
or outside of Christ, if we need to come into Christ, again, I would ask and I would urge and I would beg you to not leave this building without making your life right with Christ. And will you please do that as we stand and as we sing the invitation song? There's a fountain free, tis for you and me. Let us haste, oh haste to its spring. Tis the fount of love from the source above, and he bids us all freely drink. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you. seated at this time. I'd like to thank Brother Sam for that lesson. I appreciate the words that he's brought to us this morning. This time we'll take some time in our worship service this morning to remember the Lord's Supper. As we prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 511, Off We Come Together. And think about the words of this song as we do prepare for the Lord's Supper. Off we come together Off we
Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful that we can gather around this memorial feast. We're thankful for the love of, of Jesus for coming to, to, to die on that cruel cross of Calvary, Father. Father, be with us as we take of this bread that represents that suffering body. May we do so in a manner that's pleasing to thee. In Christ Jesus' holy name, amen. Likewise, Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this cup, which represents the blood that was shed by our loving Savior as he willingly sacrificed his life so that we might have the hope for the remission of our sins. Pray that those who partake in this would do so in a manner that's well-pleasing unto thee, and they'll uh, remember and think back to the pain and suffering that our Lord Savior and your son went through. This is our prayer, in Jesus Christ's holy name, amen.
This concludes the Lord's Supper, have we neglected to serve anyone? At this time, it's been a set aside to give a very appropriate time on the first day of the week. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for this day, the first day of the week. We're thankful that for our jobs, our talents, our abilities to make a living. Father, we know all good things come from thee. Father, be with us as we give, may we give as a cheerful giver, and may we give as we have prospered, Father. Father, we're thankful for your love and your blessings. In Christ Jesus' holy name, amen. Draw your attention to our evang ongoing evangelism efforts. Of course, tonight will be quarantine two. Doug Aaron's group meets before worship. Uh, quick update, we had five visitors from the community last week at our services. Six contact cards were submitted. 47 compassion cards written, four visits made and one new converts class. And also we had our Mission Monday meeting. If you know of someone that we need to contact or can serve, please fill out a contact card on the evangelism table. And don't forget to team two to meet tonight. Uh, Let's pray for those that we have been contacting with cards. Our Heavenly Father, we pray the blessings upon Sarah Feltz and also Mike Hullett in the death of Jennifer Hullett. We also pray for <clears throat> Natalie and Lucas Lynn in the death and the passing of Steve. We also pray for Adam and Heather Carter who lost a three-year-old daughter. We pray for Sabrina Gross as she is fighting cancer. We pray for Mark Lowry in heart surgery. Also for Benny Roberts with a kidney transplant. And also for Jim May who is suffering sickness from an unknown cause. And be with us and help us each week to reach out and shine a light to those round about us to love them and be involved in their lives. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. Come to the point in our service where we're about to close. I invite you to stand with me. We'll sing number 523. We'll only sing the first verse of this song. Then we'll be dismissed in prayer. There is beyond the azure blue a God concealed from human sight. He tinted skies with heavenly hue and framed the worlds with his great might. There is a God, he is alive, in him we live and we survive.
Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and all the many blessings you have given us. We thank you for the portion of thy word that we have heard today that Brother Sam has brought to us. And we pray that you would please be with him and his works and efforts and upcoming trip to Australia that uh, much success would come from that and, and the glory would be given to thee. Father, we pray that you would please be with all those mentioned today who were sick, that are sick, those that have lost loved ones, and please comfort them as only you can. As we're about to depart, Father, let's always remember the greatest love and sacrifice given in Jesus that so freely laid his life down for us, and please help us to take the gospel to others. Father, please forgive us for our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.